welcome to the Pope on Film. I am Bunny Williams, and with me is... Reverend Steve, the founder and Pope of his very own religion, the Church of Ed Wood, which is uh, still up and kicking since 1996. It's up at uh, edwood.org, and it gets updated once or twice a millennium. So you should go check that out. It's the, There's some good stuff there. There's a lot of good stuff there. There's a lot of good stuff there. Um, yeah. A lot of links to free movies. Boobs. Boobs. Yeah. There's boobs. Yeah. Which I always yeah. have to be careful about when I'm going there from work. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, man. Yeah. I don't know about, I don't know about, I don't know about everybody. I think this is just an Oklahoma thing, but on my local TV, they show uh, two hours of the Maury Povich show every oh every day, that and hurts. it's just wonderful. Yeah. It's wonderful. I love it so much. <laughs> the other day I was giving my uh, – apparently I watch it a lot because the other day I was holding Maxwell, and he's three, and I, and I said, Maxwell, do you know who I am? And And he said, no. And I said, "Yeah, you do. I'm your, I'm your father." And she said, "You are not the father." <laughs> and then he started doing a little dance. So he apparently, he apparently watches a lot of Maury with me, more than yeah. I realized. He's picking up random things right now because he's starting to talk so, so well, much good ishly. Yeah, that uh-huh. he's really he's really starting to pick up some random things. Like the other day, so fabulous. I was, yeah, the other day I was talking to Bella, and we we were getting kind of passionate about whatever it was we were talking about. I don't remember what it was what we were talking about because suddenly he just got between the both of us and put his hands up and he said, "Now both of you, stop it! <laughs> Calm down, just breathe." He, he's he's picking up a bunch of random things. The other day, I was reading the new issue of Entertainment Weekly, and uh, Chris Pratt happened to be on it. Yeah. And uh, he pointed and he said, "Daddy, do you know who that is?" And I said, "I know who that is, but do you know who that is? Do you know who it is, Maxwell?" And then he put his arms down and he said, "A, a perfect in a perfect recreation." He said, "Star Lord, man." <laughs> Guys, so that's good. I'm proud of that. That's proud, good proud, good. proud of that. He's picking up things. He's in that that kind of parody phase. Yeah. Anyway, I love a good episode of Maury. <laughs> it's good, good stuff. <laughs> Big cool. fan of the Maury Povich show. I haven't seen him in like a hundred fucking years. I the the thing that I was thinking of today is that. I never see a date on these episodes. There's never any anything on these episodes that kind of watermark it as being recorded at any certain period in time. For all I know, the episode that I'm watching is an episode that was recorded five or ten years ago. Yeah. And I find that to be quite interesting. More I watch a lot of up. TV. Yeah. I watch a lot of TV here. Especially yeah. late at night because they have this wonderful block from like nine o'clock to midnight where they just play um they play The Simpsons and then American Dad and then Family Guy. And then American yeah. Dad again and then the Cleveland show and then Family Guy again and then they show an hour of community. Okay. So it's really like four hours of just wonderful, wonderful television. <laughs> and it's every Monday through Friday, and it, that's usually what I pass out in front of. All right. Cool. Cool. I don't know. It's I, also... I, I haven't been able to get into any of those shows, really. I mean, sure, The Simpsons for a while, you know, but then it just kind of wore off. I don't like do South Park either, unless there's a particular episode I've heard about, you know. The yeah, good, but a lot of the animated shows, I don't really do that. For some reason, I don't even know why, you know. But yeah, just don't really get into them much. 
Um, well, because I live so far from a major city, I don't get every station. Maybe every other day we'll get the PBS stations, and we get four PBS stations, and there's like two regular PBS stations that we get. And then there's a third PBS station that seems to just be cooking and travel shows and occasional Bob Ross reruns. Yeah. And then a fourth PBS of just kid shows that really suck. And well, then you know, we I, get... I just don't watch TV, but I remember I remember for a while when I was trying to pick up things from an antenna here, uh, I was chasing SmackDown all over the fucking place. SmackDown? I don't the hell it was on. Could swear it was on at this time. Turned out it was another day, but then it was on this day over here. Yeah, so I was like, "This is too much fucking work trying to find this goddamn show." There are certain shows that my family has to watch, but unfortunately, a lot of them are on ABC, which is a station that we don't get. We only get a certain, a couple of stations. So a lot yeah. of times when I go to work, it'll be my job to try and download those shows. So I'll uh-huh. get to work, and I'll get my phone all set up, and I'm like, okay, I need to record Revenge for my wife and Pretty Little Liars for my daughter. I need to record these two shows for me, and and I, my my phone works harder than I do at my work. Really? Which is, <laughs> which is good, because it's just trying to catch up with everything. Huh. I've been obsessed with this really wonderful, bad... Mexican wrestling show called Lucha Underground. Oh, okay. it's on the El Rey Network, which is Robert Rodriguez's cable station. I've heard a lot of talk about it. It just didn't hit me as too terribly interesting yet. I think I have it on Roku somewhere. I haven't heard of a single person that has this network, but I have heard some things. Like I, I was kind of disappointed to hear that he was doing a TV show based on From Dust Till Dawn, and I was like, oh, really? Eh. But then I heard that it's apparently supposed to be absolutely wonderful. Yeah. It, well, not absolutely wonderful, but I've heard that it's not bad. Yeah. And then they show a whole bunch of, like, really bad movies and grindhouse movies. And uh, during the New Year, they had, like, a Godzilla marathon that yeah that I was interested in. Anyway, they under, have a new... Under the Dome has gotten me put off from trying any new shows, because that sucks. <laughs> yeah. I hated that show. I don't know if you've tried it. Based on the Stephen mm. King book? No, yeah. because... um. I wanted to read the book, but it, sometimes reading a Stephen King book is just like a like a challenge. Yeah. Because it's, it's so huge. And then sometimes he doesn't write the best endings. No. Oh at God. All. Fucking endings. So I was I was like, should I read Under the Dome? I don't know. It seems interesting, but it's so big. So I just said, fuck it, and I figured out what the ending was. Yeah. And now that I know what the ending was, I really don't want to read the book. So <laughs> I've kind of stayed. It was. What's, what's the ending? Do, should I should I spoiler alert it? Oh, it sucks. Yeah, spoil it. Yeah. Well, the ending of the book is um, there. They the dome was placed there by aliens in essentially the same way that we have ant farms. And we tap on the glass and we see, oh, hey, look at these small primitive creatures. Let's let's look at what they do in here. Essentially, that's what the aliens did with this small town. That that sucks. Yeah. Yeah, it does. I'd rather watch the Simpsons movie than have to sit and watch any sort of Under the Dome. Yeah. I was burned the the one that really burned me was it and I read it and that was like this huge like cinder block of a book. And I'm like, this is really good and oh the characters are really good and this is almost kinda of scary and I really, really like this and then you get to the end and it's like fucking like, what? <laughs> I spent a month and a half of my life trying to read this freaking epic poem that you wrote here, Mr. King. And that was the ending? Oh, you suck. I I Absolutely. got I got through those, but the the Gunslinger series, the Dark Tower series, that was my breaking point. 
This guy yeah. was like, you sucked me in for how many fucking years now? A year ago, I said, a year ago, I said, you know what? I've never bothered trying to read any of those Dark Tower gunslinger books. Never bothered. I'll pick up the first one and I'll read it and, you know, I'll give it a chance. I mean, this book isn't that big and I've heard so many things about it. So, yeah, I'll sit down and I'll read it. And I, I could not get through that thing. I think I had like, 20 or 30 pages left until I just went, you know what? I, I can't do this. This is horrible. <laughs> absolutely. I cannot finish this. This is just I, ab- absolutely pointless. I, I am in no way entertained or I just can't do it. Yeah. I talked to my wife and my, my wife said that she loved the book, but she read it when she she started reading it, the, that first book when she was maybe like in high school. So I thought, okay, well, maybe if I was like younger, I might, I might be interested in this. But God, I can't sit and read this now. Just I forget how old I was. And, well, I'm, I had to have, I gotta have twenty years on your wife now. Yeah, yeah, give or take, whatever. Um, I started reading it when the Gunslinger came out, and it was like, okay, this is good, this is interesting. And then uh, the next book didn't come out for like fucking five years or some shit. Or no, the first three came out really quick, and then there was like a five-year hang before the next fucking book. Yeah. So much so I forgot that he was writing a series. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Uh, and then as he got into further books, he went back and rewrote the first fucking book. Yeah. And I was like, son of a bitch, really? You're retrofitting the series already? <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty horrible. So that was a big disappointment that took a lot of my life for a yeah. bad ending. <laughs> yeah. You know. Um, so we talked a little bit, and maybe this is something that we shouldn't particularly talk on the show. You tell me, and we'll just stop. No big deal, though. Uh, but I had mentioned possibly paying Emerald 50 bucks to... Um, Finish transcribing uh, creation of the humanoids for me. Yeah, what did you I'm. I'm thinking of making her do it. She is grounded right now, and it's like her first major grounding because she's yeah. been grounded for little tiny things. But apparently, uh, my wife had been missing some really super expensive makeup of hers for like six months. And then, like a like a uh, Auntie Lauren was missing something, and she she was asking everybody about it because it was this really nice makeup that she had been looking for for a really long time. And everybody's like, "Oh, we have no idea." So one day, I was looking for a specific tie that she was going to sew for me. So right. we were looking in a room, and we found a whole bunch of like like two or three things of various people's that that had gone missing in a uh-huh. room, and so now she's just, she, it's a serious grounding. Yeah. So she's been grounded for like a week, and I've just been kind of staying away from it, and my wife has been kind of spearheading the, okay, you need to do the dishes, and then after that you got to do this, and after that you got to go watch the dog, and after that you got to, like, really being hard on her about it. But it wasn't until recently that I realized, like, wait a second, I can get in on this on my own way. So I'm like, okay, Emerald, sit down. I'm going to put a movie on. She's, what movie? It's like, it's called Walk Hard. It's it's an R-rated movie, but I'm going to make you watch it. And she's like, I don't want to watch it. I want to read my book. And I was like, okay, well, how about this? You're grounded. Sit your ass down. We're going to watch this movie. So that's what I've been doing lately. I, I've, yeah. Emerald. I just watched this amazing match on Lucha Underground, and I really think that, that you'd love it. It's a triple threat match, three wrestlers from Mexico. It's incredible, and if you if you sit down and give it a chance, you're really going to like it. And if you don't want to watch it, I can force you to do it because you're grounded. <laughs> okay. So she's like, uh, I don't want to watch wrestling. And I'm like, fine, you're grounded. Sit your ass down. We're going to watch this wrestling match. I did that last night, and, and she was like, she she had apparently never seen Mexican wrestling before, and I'm like, she said, Dad, are these are these guys wrestling? Because it's more like they're flipping around and doing acrobatics. I mean, 
<laughs> it's because real Mexican wrestling is less of a fight like WWE and more like three bizarre acrobats flipping around and doing tricks and like a dance. It's really quite beautiful. And so she was kind of floored by it. So I'm thinking of maybe forcing her to sit down and watch Creation of the Humanoids and to transcribe this. Yeah. And maybe give her the money. I don't know. I mean, I should give her the money because she would earn the money, but I could also keep it because I'm an asshole. You could split it. And then, yeah, or split it or maybe give it to her when she's off grounding. I don't know. But, but I'm, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it. I don't want to ask her because she'll automatically say no, so I've, I've just been kind of mulling it over for the past couple of days. Okay, okay cool. Because I, I really want to do that fucking movie, man. I've started on working on the special effects already. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I want to get my hands on the script, but that is transcribing it from boring shit. It does make good yeah. punishment work. You yeah. Know. But I was kind of like, well, uh, it's like an automated thing online that I found, and you can just upload it and do it for free. And um, what you get back because of that is fucking horrible. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. In fact, I have it here somewhere. <laughs> That's funny. So this is basically where I last left off. I took the audio and I just clipped it to what I last had and I sent it over and I had them transcribe it. Yeah. And this is the scene with Kragus and his sister with um, the robot Pax. Yeah. Okay. So this is that scene. You and you will you will know if you need to be open or open an outlet and great activity in Bartlett, a national one and will enable you an extra money could have brought in local news is the greatest good for you. I mean, temperature is the person you get out of here, not at all. That's totally useful. <laughs> There's this porn website that I go to once in a while. Yeah. And it's in a it's in a foreign language, but you can switch it to English. And I I started just not switching it to English because every time you switch it to English, it's just this girl is the very hot. She is wanting the sex. She sees the man, and the man also wants the thing. And it's just it's so horrible that it's just oh you know what I'm just gonna leave it in French or German or whatever the hell it is because the last thing I want is to I'm watching this video it's called the woman hot in shower with Manva <laughs> that's what that reminds me of but it got such good reviews you know yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So we want I don't to start know. With? You want to start with Guardians of the Galaxy? You want to start with uh, Ed Wood? Uh, we. I want to start with the homework. I want to start with the homework. Oh, before we start with the homework, I should mention that um, I am going to be watching Doctor Who for the first time and blogging about it. So you should go to my blog reverendsteve.blogspot.com and check that out because a, like a number of months ago I started watching Firefly for the first time and blogging about that and that got a really good response and people were really liking that and so I wanted to watch all of the Doctor Whos but technically that's impossible so after reading a few books about Doctor Who and reading a few magazines and going to a few web pages and uh, talking to a few Doctor Who fans, I've come upon a compromise wherein I will be watching the most pertinent storylines from each and every Doctor. Uh-huh. So I'll be watching, like, the first four shows of the first plot line to give me an introduction to the first Doctor, and then the storyline after that is is the introduction of the weirdo, cheap-looking robotic trash can monsters. It, yeah. Daleks or Daleks? I refer to them as Daleks. I don't know why. Okay. Okay. 
it's probably how they pronounce it more on the show. Yeah. I really guess I got so, it. so I won't be watching all of them because technically that's impossible. So I'll be watching the important plot lines of each and every doctor from from the beginning to the most recent. I think when I get to the most recent, like the 90s and the 2000s and all that, then I'll just watch them all the way through. Uh-huh. But I, it, it's kind of impossible to watch every episode. So I'll be posting the first one in just a couple of days. I've got the first episode on my phone. It's just all black and white and old and bizarre, and I'm going to have a bunch yeah. of fun with that. Cool. So I wanted to mention that. Uh, right off the bat, because I'm really excited about that. For Christmas, uh, a, a, a dear, dear friend of mine um, got me a shirt, and it's the character of the pigeon from the kids' book, Don't Let the Pigeon Drive the Bus. The pigeon, I have this giant pigeon doll, and the doll comes to story time all the time, and he pecks me in the face. And the kids love the pigeon, and I love the pigeon. He's appeared in a number of books, and I really, really like him. And it's the Can pigeon. Do a short film of the pigeon? Yeah, I think so. The pigeon appears in the book, Don't Let the Pigeon Drive the Bus, but she found me a shirt, and it's the pigeon wanting to drive uh, the TARDIS. And I love the shirt, but at the same time, I don't feel that I've deserved the ability to wear a Doctor Who shirt. Uh Uh-huh. Because if I wear a Doctor Who shirt, then that would signify that I am a Doctor Who fan. And I'm not necessarily a Doctor Who fan because I haven't really seen anything. I've watched a couple of episodes of The Fourth Doctor when I was a kid and remember saying, hey, that monster looks weird. Hey, the TARDIS looks neat. Hey, that's a stupid-looking robotic dog, and but I, I'm not a fan. Right. So it's my mission to be able to earn wearing the shirt I got for Christmas. Yeah, I wouldn't really call myself a Doctor Who fan either. Uh, each season and each new Doctor kind of has to, like, earn me back, if you know. Yeah before I buy into the show or not. And mostly they've been doing that, so that's cool, you know. But, you know, I wouldn't call myself a huge Doctor Who fan. I like it. Yeah. So I will be trying to earn the shirt that I already own. Yes. I own it, but I have a good plan. Yeah, I think it's a good plan, and it'll be fun. It'll be I think that my first reaction is going to be, okay, I know the show has been around for over 50 years, but, God, this first episode looks like shit. (laughs) It's like, wow, this is a a bizarre soap opera. I don't know how this turned into one of the longest-running television shows in history, but whatever. I'm assuming that's how it's going to start. But I don't know because I haven't watched it yet. But I'll be watching it soon, and that's going to be a bunch of fun. So I wanted to mention that. That's going to be a bunch of fun. So go to my website, my blog, reverendsteve.blogspot.com, or you can, uh, there's a link to it on the church page, edwood.org. So either one of those. You haven't gotten given up on uh, Firefly, have you? Oh, no, not at all. Not at all. It's just that when I'm posting about Firefly, I like having a bit of, uh, I like having internet. So I can yeah. post this picture, and I can post this link, and, and this and that. And I just don't have the internet for that. But I think that Doctor Who, is, there's so much Doctor Who that I think that I could easily write in, about that without needing all the bells and whistles. So I see. I'm starting Doctor Who as soon as possible. But I've, I've, I've got all the fireflies here at home. I just need to eventually get back to that. Okay, cool. But, 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 today's, uh, this week's homework yes. is from Rhino. And man, I loved Rhino. And frankly, in the 90s. Kind of a genius move on their part. I yeah. Thought. But in the 90s is when I really just dove head first into the world of bad movies and retro, anything I could get my hands on. And so Rhino was really a company that I was in love with. 
because they released a lot of old music and they released movies and they they were just this major, major company in my life. If I had a bad movie, there was a 75% chance that it came from one specific company. Uh -huh. they, re okay. they released a lot of Ed Wood's movies in, on video. Even before the Tim Burton movie came out, they were releasing a whole bunch of that stuff. So I have VHS copies of a bunch of movies because of them. Like my the first time I ever owned... Uh, a copy of Planning from Outer Space or A Bucket of Blood came from Rhino. And I loved Rhino. I see. And so in 1994, they released a straight-to-video documentary. A, and it's available on YouTube. You should check it out. It's only 51 minutes long for Pete's sake. It's called yeah. Ed Wood Look Back in Angora. <laughs> and... It's narrated by Gary Owens. Uh huh. I love that. I love Gary Owens. He has that bizarre monotone voice from uh, Laugh In, and he was the voice of Space Ghost. Yeah. The original cartoon and the the bizarre Adult Swim uh -huh. and cartoon. And a lot of fucking game shows. Yeah. And now he's the voice of Antenna TV, which is one of the TV stations I get here on on my bizarre Oklahoma television, where they show just nonstop bizarre reruns. Like my my youngest daughter the other day was like, "Daddy, what what's that?" And I'm like, "It's a TV show. It's called Mr. Ed." <laughs> what is that horse doing? Well, that horse can talk. Why? Well, I don't really have an answer for that. I guess because they thought it was funny? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but now Gary Owens is the voice for Antenna TV, and that makes me happy because apparently he's still alive, and that's pretty yeah. amazing. But Look Back in Angora, it's a, it's a biography of Ed Wood that uses actual footage from Ed Wood movies and it's it's very well done. It does a good job of, of getting bits and pieces from various films of his and combines them into a really nice well, sort of cliff notes to the life of Ed Wood. And I like... Yes, a, a little too jokey in spots, I felt. Yeah, but I, but I find it to be more factually correct than the actual movie Ed Wood, Although the movie yeah. Ed Wood is probably just more entertaining, I have a problem with biopics in general, I think. Yeah. Because I think that when someone does a biopic of someone, that the majority of people who watch that movie will take that movie as 100% absolute fact. Right. And I don't think it's possible for a biopic to be 100% absolute fact. I, there's going to be some problems down the way. One of the biggest, one of the, I think the biggest sins ever committed in, in relationship to that topic is the movie Confessions of a Dangerous Mind. Did you ever see that oh, movie? Okay. Yes, I kind of love it. It's a good movie, but the problem is is that it's ad it was advertised as based on the true life story of Chuck Barris. Yeah. It, well, it's based on the autobiography of Chuck Barris, which was a complete and total tongue-in-cheek lie. Yeah. <laughs> There's no proof at all that the guy who hosted the gong show was some sort of super top secret spy. That's part of what I love about this fucking movie, man. It's 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 because it is just so. It's like, do you think people are really buying this somewhere? I mean, <laughs> right? But when like, when a movie comes beautiful. out like based on the based on the true life story of Chuck Barris, then people will see that movie and go, okay, well then this movie must be one hundred percent fact. So the guy who hosts the Gong Show must have been a spy. When in fact. That's not at all true. I've had some people 
has come up to me because I have the Church of Ed Wood, and and it's like, so tell me about the time that Ed Wood met Orson Welles. It's just, no, that didn't happen. Yeah. They just threw that in the movie because they thought it would be entertaining. Just because it's a biopic doesn't mean that it's absolutely true. One of the things... It's a nice juxtaposition. I mean, you know, that's the thing is... Yeah. Uh, a writer, and particularly a screenwriter, you know, I, I know there's no biopic that's even close to any kind of truth. I, I don't even look for truth in them. You know, it's just like, is that a good depiction? You know, are, are you getting the points across? Are you getting the feeling across that you yeah. want to get across? You know? Yeah. So him meeting Orson Welles made a really great juxtaposition. You know, the best filmmaker in the world, the worst filmmaker in the world, that whole kind of shit, you know, but it works, yeah. you know, but it doesn't necessarily have to be true. Yeah. And and another problem lies with the actual book that the movie is based on, because the script, Edward, is loosely based on the yeah. book Nightmare of Ecstasy. Mm. Which is which was written with finger quotes by Rudolph Gray, but it's not a typical biography. It's one of those biographies that's actually just a uh, series of interviews from various people. So like there'll be a paragraph written by this person, and then like half a page written by this person. They did the right. same thing with with the oral history of Saturday Night Live. And that was a whole oh, yeah. bunch of fun. But the problem with Nightmare of Ecstasy is that he uses some bits and pieces for, that were written in the 1950s and the 1960s. But the majority of it are interviews that were conducted in the 90s, which was years after any of these things happened. So the movie Ed Wood is loosely based on a book, which is nothing more than a series of vague reminiscences of things that happened a long time ago. Right. So it's not entirely accurate. The The biggest mistake in the movie Ed Wood is something that I uncovered because I read a lot of bad movie magazines. And there was an interview with Loretta King uh-huh. Um, the woman who played the lead in Bride of the Monster. In the movie, they painted her as having been given the starring role in Bride of the Monster solely because Edward thought she had money. Right. Mm-hmm. When, in fact, um, she's just a... a much better actress than the person who was going to play that part, Dolores Fuller, from Glen or Glenda, who can't act her way out of a paper bag. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So that whole story of I, she got the part because she had money was literally just a lie that Ed Wood told his girlfriend so that he could give the part to someone who could actually act. Yeah, I mean, I mean, try explaining that to your girlfriend too. <laughs> yeah, it's like sure, You're I promised you the part, but you can't and act. And here's this person, and she's done a lot of actual acting. I'm going to give it to her, and I'll just think up some story to tell <laughs> my girlfriend. But then when they did the book. They didn't interview Loretta King. They only interviewed the girlfriend who said that story, and so that got swept up, and next thing you know, here's the movie, and people are thinking that Ed Wood just gave a part to a, some random person. Right. Uh-huh. The, Ed Wood does a good job of explaining Ed Wood's spirit and his can-do attitude and, you know, why he's so great and it's entertaining. But if you really want to know the specifics of Ed Wood's life, here's a movie and it's less than an hour long. It's narrated by Gary Owens and it's it's pretty damn entertaining. And that was the homework for this week. It's totally free. You should check it out. It's on YouTube. (laughs) I like it. I own a copy of it on VHS. I, I like it quite a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's a very good. good, very interesting movie. It 
it does not shy away from, uh, you know, from the darker side of what was going on with Ed, because there was a lot of dark shit going on there. I really want to see the fucking, uh, the ABC's a sex one day, man. That looks so fucking bizarre. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Pretty sure I'm getting the title right. Not dead sure, but yeah, that film, that film is kind of lost. I've poked around looking for it a bit, but that looks so fucked up. I'm a big you know? fan. I'm a big fan of Orgy of the Dead. He didn't direct it. It was directed by uh, Stephen Apostoloff, but the screenplay was written by Ed Wood. You can tell because the the. <sighs> heroine in the movie is named Shirley and she wears a Angora sweater through the whole movie. But yeah. literally it, it it's one of the worst movies of all time if you're watching it. Because most of the movie is just a number of really bad strip teases that go on for insanely long periods of time with insanely unattractive women that they picked up on the Sunset Strip somewhere. It's really yeah. bad. But if you don't watch it, if you just listen to it, it's one of the most beautiful experiences you'll ever have. Because one day my TV didn't work. I could hear things, but the picture was completely gone. So I started experimenting. and like, what would happen if I just put Clue in? And I can't watch it, but I can hear it. Would it be the same? Right. Would, it, would, I, would I be as entertained with it? If I was just listening to it, and I experimented with a lot of movies and Jurassic Park and Interview with the Vampire, and I was putting everything in, and then I put in Orgy of the Dead, and oh my God, it was just the most beautiful thing in the world, and I absolutely love it. Uh-huh. That was Edward's monster nudie period. Yeah. I, I've had it in my queue. I haven't gotten around to watching it. For you. it it's quite entertaining. If yeah. you're not really paying attention to it, the music is just absolutely beautiful. It's really wonderful. Yeah. So, anyway, should we delve into this week's movie? Good God, yes. <laughs> there is so this week's fear. movie is the legendary film Batman and Robin. For me, the nipples on the costume were a fucking stroke of genius. Yes. Okay. I cannot imagine not having nipples on the bat suit anymore. Okay. Yeah. I just I just rewatched it over the weekend and posted about it on Facebook too. There's nothing wrong with Batman and Robin. Everybody should see it. This is another movie that I am going to champion as a good movie. That's the, the one way with I Batgirl, enjoy, right? Ages. What? That's the one with Batgirl, right? Yes, yeah, Alicia Silverstone. Yes, I love how easy it is for a butler to apparently program his entire humanity into a bat computer. <laughs> apparently that's just the easiest thing in the world for, like, an elderly butler to do, to just program his entire humanity and human being spirit into a freaking computer. Easiest thing in the world. <laughs> This week's movie is but Guardians the of the Butler. Yeah. This week's movie is Guardians of the Galaxy, a small art film from 2014 that I don't think a lot of people yeah. saw. I, I don't. I don't think a lot of people have seen it. I don't think a lot of people have heard about it. Uh, it has, you know, of course, like most most kind of indie underground independent films, it really didn't get a whole lot of buzz. A couple of podcasts did it, things like that, and that's why we are trying to promote this to try to get this Guardians of the Galaxy movie, um, you may have heard of some, some more, some more, um, oh, God, what's the word I'm looking for? Some more exposure. Some more exposure yeah. to get it out there further, you know. Um, it's it's something for the kids. It's something for the adults. It's something for everybody. And it's really a high watermark for independent film, you know, yeah. in and of itself. I mean, it so, so in that regard, it is, Pretty brown, groundbreaking. Yeah, it's the tenth Marvel Cinematic movie. Came out last year. I gotta say, I think it was the most doubted of the Marvel films. Yeah, because I, I just, 
read a million different articles about, oh, Marvel's taking a big chance, taking a big risk, taking an unknown property, blah, blah, blah. Hey, has Marvel, is Marvel going to strike out with this next film? And all of that is kind of laughable now that Guardians of the I, Galaxy was the highest grossing movie of 2014. I don't really follow that kind of stuff. I don't follow you know, websites and things like that about what's coming out and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you really have to stick my face to get me to notice, you know. I follow that so, stuff when it's something that I care about. Like, I read a lot of that same sort of chatter with the last Godzilla movie. And people were going, oh, America doing another Godzilla film. Will this be... Will this be another bomb like Matthew Broderick's Godzilla? Like he wrote, produced, and directed the whole damn thing. But <laughs> he, but so I I was just thinking, oh my god, I hope this is huge so that Godzilla can be like a a cool thing now. Because for the longest time, it's kind of been a joke because of that stupid movie. So yeah. I, so when everyone doubted Godzilla, I was like, oh come on, this this has to be huge. Come on, let's all get behind this. So when it came out and it was huge, I was like, yes! And I... I I'm a, I'm a big Marvel comic book fan, and I gotta say, I knew nothing about Guardians of the Galaxy. Even I knew, like, jack shit. But in the beginning of 2013... I knew Rocket. I knew Rocket, yeah. because Rocket had at least one or maybe two limited series back in the 80s, and that was the big time when I was collecting. Um, yeah. Uh, like a... a I'm thinking either a two- or a four-issue limited series. So I knew who Rocket Raccoon was. And I was like, I don't give a fuck if Marvel falls on its face, you know? Yeah. They'll make another Avengers movie. It doesn't make us, you know, they're not going to be destroyed, you know? So I didn't care about all the talk talk about Guardians of the Galaxy leading up. But then when that first trailer came out, I was like, all right, you got me. You got me. Yeah. You got me. You got well, me with hooks on the fucking ceiling. You got me with this awesome, badass raccoon. Yeah. And you got me with Chris Pratt giving the finger in the trailer. Yeah. This was when, awesome. Well, I I wanted to find out what Guardians of the Galaxy was when they first announced that they were going to make a movie. So I I went looking for some information, and at that time, around the beginning of 2013, so maybe like a year and a half before the movie Guardians of the Galaxy came out, they decided to give the Guardians of the Galaxy their own comic book again, maybe like the third or fourth time. So it, it was kind of a reboot, but a reboot in the sense that Marvel Comics does a reboot, so they're saying, okay, we're going to give them a new series and kind of start them out. If when DC Comics does a re when DC Comics yeah. does a reboot, then they just go, okay, well let's kill everybody. This is going to be an alternate universe. Okay, let's start everybody over again. Let's press the reset button. But like, like Marvel does some a, characters, they have a hard time getting off the fucking ground. You know, yeah. like uh, Moon Knight. Yeah. You know how many fucking times have they tried Moon Knight out? Yeah, you like know, a bajillion times. Dagger. You know. Yeah. So yeah, uh, that's kind of that's. I don't ever remember an actual Guardians of the Galaxy comic book, you know, with all of them in it. But well, Raccoon at least was a character that they tried out a few times in a few different places. Yeah. Well, the reboot uh, was written by what's his name, Brian Michael Brian Michael Bendis. He writes ninety nine percent of all the Marvel comic books for like the last decade, and he's amazing. And he restarted Guardians of the Galaxy, and it's just amazing. From it, the the first uh, graphic novel is just a, a wonderful piece of work, and it does a great job of explaining everyone and who everyone was, and um, it, it explains to you who Peter Quill's dad is. It explains to you his whole backstory, everybody's backstory. Not only that, but at that time uh Iron Man was yeah. starting to become more uh, conscious about the universe and not just earth because he realized okay well you know there's there's problems everywhere not just on this planet 
So in this reboot, Iron Man is a member of the Guardians of the Galaxy. And it's really wonderful to read because in in space, he's not the richest guy in the world. And in space, yeah. he's not the he's not the most technologically savvy person in the world. In fact, they're constantly making fun of him for his primitive technology, which is wonderful. Uh-huh. And uh, it, it's really great to kind of see him as like a fish out of water character. Yeah. It's it's really in fact when they were first writing the script for Guardians of the Galaxy. Iron Man was going to have a cameo. He was going what? to appear in... Yeah, Iron Man was going to appear in Guardians of the Galaxy. But at that point, uh, what's his name? Robert Downey Jr. was having some contract disputes, so right. they decided to write his cameo out of it. So uh, he he ended up not being in it. But... Um, the next one wants to be read to him. But it, he was going to be in it, and that that's pretty awesome. I'm still hoping that maybe in Guardians of the Galaxy 2 he'll appear. He might not appear, but he's definitely going to be in Avengers 3 and Avengers 4, because that's all going to be set in space and deal with Thanos and all of that stuff. So that's really right. awesome. Um, he, and I mentioned that Guardians of the Galaxy was the most doubted uh, Marvel movie because I have the preview for Ant Man just came out. I have not. I have not looked at the trailer. I looked at the poster. I like. The well, they. I was laughing at the poster. Well, they teased everybody by releasing what they called the ant size trailer first, and the ant size trailer is a regular movie trailer, but it was only seventeen seconds long. <laughs> And then a few days after that, they released the actual human-sized trailer, and that literally just came out, I think, a, a day ago. And they've been working on the Ant-Man movie since before they started making Marvel comic book movies. And I keep hearing the same things that I heard from Guardians of the Galaxy. Oh, they're taking an obscure character. Oh, people don't really know who Ant-Man is. Oh, this is going to be—is this going to be a train wreck and all that sort of stuff? So I'm, I'm pretty excited for Ant Man, and I'm hoping that it's going to be big. Yeah, Ant Man you know? is a character I could just give a shit about. I just, I just can't give a shit. So it's going to be like a, you know, pop well, when it comes on Netflix kind of a view. The interesting thing is the way that they're doing Ant Man because originally Ant Man is Hank Pym and he's one of the original Avengers, and eventually he gets kind of crazy and an alcoholic, and he beats his wife, and he is exiled from the Avengers, and he becomes a bad guy, and all this sort of, like, really high drama stuff. But then there was a second Ant-Man, and so that's what the Ant-Man movie is going to be about. It's not going to be about Hank Pym. Hank Pym is going to be in the Ant-Man movie, but he's going to be played by Michael Douglas as a really old guy looking for kind of a successor. Uh Uh-huh, okay. So the Ant-Man is actually going to... Yeah, so the Ant-Man in this movie is actually going to be the second person who was Ant-Man who was a criminal named Scott Lang who one day just stole the Ant-Man outfit just because he was a robber, because he was trying to make money so that he could take care of his uh, daughter. So yeah, there would have to be a good reason, a good noble reason. Yeah. So yeah. so this second movie is actually going to be played by this. This movie is going to be played by Scott Lang and not Hank Pym, and the Scott Lang is going to be played by Paul Rudd, and I love Paul Rudd. Okay. So I'm really excited about this Paul Rudd. Uh, Marvel comic book movie. Never would have thought that Paul Rudd would star in a Marvel comic book movie, but the preview looks pretty damn good. So I'm pretty excited about that. So now, what did you think about the characters as they as they go from movie to comic? In Guardians of the Galaxy? Yeah. Um. Well, God. Okay. Let's let's talk about this. 
Uh, Chris Pratt is amazing. I am absolutely. I've never watched amazing. Parks and Recreation. My girlfriend watched it a little bit, didn't like it, so we don't watch it. You know how that goes. <laughs> yeah, no, I absolutely know how that goes. Uh, I love Chris Pratt. Parks and Recreation, that first season is kind of okay. The second season gets better. And originally, Chris Pratt was just hired for six episodes, but there's just something about him that's very honest and charismatic and friendly. So they, yeah. they put him in more episodes and then more episodes, and now he's just one of the stars of the show. And it's really, really wonderful. He He's just he's absolutely perfect for that role. And at the same time, there's just something that's very honest about him. There's a part of, there's just a part of Peter Quill where he, watching Guardians of the Galaxy where you wonder, is this Chris Pratt acting or is this Chris Pratt just having fun? Yeah. And I, there's just something very charismatic about Chris Pratt and about the way he does Peter Quill, and I really like that. I, Gamora, she's supposed to be more of the, in the comic book, she's supposed to be more of like a, like a, more of a badass, more of a murderous, more of a, you know, she's, she's called the most dangerous woman in the galaxy, and I don't think that in this movie she's the most dangerous woman in the galaxy. And I don't no. like the fact that they kind of tried to force some sort of a romance into the film. Oh, God, film. yes. I really want but, to stop that right now. But in the comic book, Tony Stark does banger. Tony Stark can, okay? If they want to make a movie of Tony Stark banging Gamora, I, I'll watch that. Okay. And the best part about it is that the uh, apparently they hint towards it. They, they go... They hint towards the fact that Tony Stark is kind of scared afterwards. Right. So then there's a scene in, like, another issue where Groot's talking. They, uh, it's Rocket's talking to Iron Man, and Rocket's just saying, it's like, why did you even do that? I mean, I could have warned you. <laughs> but why did you do that? And so... Iron Man explains why he had sex with Gamora, and it's just one of the best little bits. So he says, I can tell you why I had sex with her. Have you ever watched Star Trek? Okay. <laughs> and he's like, no, what's that? Oh, it's uh, Earth uh, Television Entertainment. <clears throat> it, it's uh, Captain James T. Kirk, and Rocket goes, I don't know who he is. Who is he the captain of? And Iron Man goes, he's the captain of the USS Enter. You know what? It doesn't matter. What matters is that all my life I've dreamed, I've had these dreams, and banging an, a green-skinned alien chick was always on the top of that list. <laughs> cool. And that's just, yeah. that's just wonderful. It's just <laughs> absolutely wonderful. Yeah. So when I saw it, and another thing, too, I really thought that Iron Man was going to end up in Guardians of the Galaxy because I work in the children's department of a bookstore, and a couple of months before Iron Man 3 came out, we got this kid's book, and it was a guide to the armors that Tony Stark made between Iron Man 2 and Iron Man 3. And it's uh -huh. this cute little picture book, and it, it explains every suit that he makes and all of that, but at the end of the book, it explains that the last suit that Iron Man made is this special space suit that can that will allow him to fly into outer space. And so when I saw Iron Man 3, I thought, okay, so is this movie going to end with him use, making this last suit and going into space? Because that will perfectly lead into Guardians of the Galaxy. And I think yeah. that, that that's possibly what they were going to do, what they had meant to do, and how they were going to explain Iron Man showing up in Guardians of the Galaxy. But they absolutely didn't do that, because there's no sign of a space suit anywhere in Iron Man 3. And they canceled his appearance in Guardians of the Galaxy, but I think that's where they were going to go. I, I, I think that's a good move. I mean, I can understand that you, you, you're kind of sitting back and you're like, nobody knows these characters, okay? Yeah. We want to make this movie. This movie may need a bit of a kick in the ass, though, to get people yeah. to go see it. 
So let's just try to think about an Iron Man angle, you know, because that'll put asses in chairs, you know. But then as you as you're going on, you're writing the movie, and you're like, no, this this is a strong fucking script. Yeah, kind of like in the '90s when every comic book suddenly had Wolverine appearing in it. Yeah. Oh fuck yeah. 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 So I can understand. I can understand them doing this comic book before the movie Guardians of the Galaxy and putting uh, Iron Man in it. That's understandable, and it really does work well, and it's well written. And so now I can tell people who watch the Guardians of the Galaxy movie, it's like, okay, well, I know who his, I know who his father is, and I know all about that. I know where this is going. Yeah. So I'm, that's I'm good. really glad that they didn't put Iron Man in it because I was just having such a good time spending time with these fucking characters. You know, yeah. that was that was pretty awesome. And it just would have taken away having you know, having to pay attention to Iron Man too, you know? Did you know I that Rob Zombie movie. is in this film? I have heard. I have heard. Yeah. Now, one just... thing I want to bring out about Guardians of the Galaxy, personally, um, first off, I, I was also kind of surprised that it was given to James Gunn to begin with. Right? Um, this man has that, a history of doing some pretty bizarre films. Yeah. That gave me a very kind of a... And this is actually how I got over it as well, is that it gave me a very Peter Jackson vibe. Although, right out of the yeah. box, James Gunn is... is Well, no. Uh, Jackson did some serious movies too. Oh, well, beautiful creatures or something like that. Beautiful um, Creatures is a wonderful movie. But to look at Guardians of the Galaxy, which we're going to have to get here sooner or later, so we might as well do it. Um, the comparison for Guardians of the Galaxy to Avengers. Okay. Yeah. Loved Avengers. Absolutely love Avengers. I do not consider these two things like the same thing. They're in the same universe, but these are totally different characters. Guardians and of the Galaxy Josh felt more like a, like Star Wars to me. Yeah. Josh like, Whedon, I, I totally love his dialogue, and he's a dialogue man. And as I watch it, I'm kind of like, that is exactly what you needed for the Avengers. Because you've got to get them into a place where, like, okay, you have to act like Captain Marvel. And that's all you yeah. want that dude to concentrate on is acting like Captain fucking, uh, sorry, Captain America. <laughs> yeah. You've got to act like that. And then from there, everything else that you want to bring out about the character has got to come through the dialogue. Mm -hmm. You know? So Joss Whedon was the perfect choice for that movie. James Gunn didn't do it, and he, he did an excellent fucking writing job. But he did not do it, he did not do it dialogue-based. There are some great one-liners, to be sure, but they're one-liners, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. They're not something like, there's only one God, ma'am, and I'm sure he doesn't dress like that. You know, yeah. he doesn't do any lines like that that completely inform the character. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but he did it through the action, which for this works better. It's not so much what Peter Quill says, but it's the way he's saying it and yeah. how he's acting as he's saying it that really locks down the Peter Quill character in the first fucking act, the first 20 minutes, 10 mm -hmm. minutes, you know, yeah. the scene with his mother, and then the credit scene where he where he's singing into weird rat creatures. <laughs> yeah. It looked like a, like, a, like a womp rat from Star Wars. Yeah. What yeah, I imagine it would be. Scene, you look at that whole scene and you got that this dude, he's kind of a fucking frat boy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that's exactly what that character is. And I thought that was a great way of getting that character out. I have I have kids, so I I have seen these movies a number of times. But I must mention that the that the same person who did Guardians of the Galaxy also did the two live-action Scooby-Doo movies. <laughs> Scooby-Doo and Scooby-Doo Monsters Unleashed. I might and have to go and check them, though. Well, no, they're pretty horrible, but there are some bits of genius to them. 
that I always thought and I always said, you know, even before, like, way before Guardians of the Galaxy, I would say, okay, well, I hate this Scooby-Doo movie, but the bad guy in the first Scooby-Doo movie ends up being Scrappy-Doo. And I always thought, you know what? As much as I hate this movie, that's wonderful. <laughs> I, at that point in time, I didn't realize that the same person who like wrote and directed that also did Romeo and Juliet and Dawn of the Dead and all of that. I'm just forced to watch this. Oh, and I'm like, you know what? Time. That is yeah. wonderful. That is really, is really wonderful. wonderful. And then in the second movie, a there's more of a focus on the original bad guys from the original like '60s Scooby Doo. So there's the yeah. guy with the with the you know the like undersea diver guy, and then the the like Frankenstein looking monster. All of the classic monsters you know from the first Scooby Doo are in the second movie, and I always liked that. And there's like a a few bizarre pot references to it, despite the fact that it's a kids movie. Yeah. So so there are some James Gunn moments to it that I can now say, now that I've seen Romeo and Juliet, Guardians of the Galaxy, the Dawn of the Dead, like Slither, which he also did, which oh. is really, really good. I also like the fact that he got the head of Troma Pictures, Lloyd Kaufman, to have a cameo in it. Yeah, but anybody can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lloyd Kaufman has a standing thing that if you pay, if you pay his way, basically, He'll be in any movie. Yeah. So yeah. if I was going to make a movie, I can put Lloyd Kaufman in it at any time. Yeah. You know, so. Which I can see from time to time. But, and yeah, also, his, he was definitely and also, uh, yeah. And also, James Gunn's brother is in this. Sean Gunn. He's yeah. an actor. And my kids would kill me if I didn't mention this. He. One of his most memorable roles is as Kirk in the TV show Gilmore Girls. Really? Okay. Yeah. A, my my oldest daughter and my youngest daughter, they they love Gilmore Girls. I hate he's, it. He's got a great fucking face, man. I am in love yeah, with that. Yeah, he does. Face. Yeah, he you does. You know, that is a, a character actor just face. You know, and yeah. he did a great job as fucking Rocket, because that was Rocket as well, right? I'm pretty sure. No, but no, that Rocket. Whole line, that whole line when he was like, Captain got it, teach stuff. I was just like, oh. No, Rocket was, Rocket was, man. Rocket was voiced by Bradley Cooper. Yeah. Sean Gunn was, was just that. I don't. I don't even know what to call him. Like the second in command of yeah. the Ravagers. Yeah, that's like what I the, the vice president of the Ravagers. <laughs> He's great in the show Gilmore Girls. I, I've been forced to watch every episode forwards and backwards and upside down. And yeah. he appears in like the first episode as just some random guy who just appears to deliver a package. And then in the second or third episode, they said, you know what, let's get this same actor. He can be another guy working at another restaurant. And then eventually they realize that, oh, crap, we've given this guy like 15 different jobs. <laughs> and so eventually they just made him a character on the show, and he was Kirk, and he's just this bizarre guy who has a million different jobs. Yeah. And so he's, it, it was great to see him in this. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, hey, he's from Gilmore Girls. And then I'm like, oh, crap, I just thought that sentence out loud. What a horrible <laughs> sentence for a man to be able to say, I'm so excited to see someone from Gilmore Girls. <laughs> there aren't too many men who can say this. I must also mention Drax, the Destroyer. Yes. I must mention this because he's played by Dave Batista, who is a WWE wrestler whom I've never liked. Yeah. Because he's an okay wrestler. He was never good on the mic. He was always just kind of awkward. He's a, he was, he, I, I didn't care for just him. That's a, right around when I stopped watching wrestling. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. I, he, <laughs> he, he was always a, yeah. 
he he always seemed like a very awkward wrestler. He was awkward on the mic. He just I never liked him. I never got into him. I always hated him. So when I saw that he's starring in this Marvel movie, I'm like, oh crap, this is going to be horrible. This is going to be really really bad. I'm going to be embarrassed to say that I know who this person is. And then he did an amazing job. And he, you know, he has these wonderful lines and he steals the show and his character is so well written and he does it so so wonderfully. But I think it's because his character is so awkward. Yeah. I There's a part where I feel that, you know, when I see Chris Pratt and I've seen so many interviews with him and I've seen him be himself... So I can say, oh, you know what, There's when I see him as Peter Quill, I know that there's a part of him that isn't acting because he's such a fun guy and he's so fun. So when I see Drax, this big, buff, angry guy who's very awkward and bizarre, there's a part of me who thinks, okay, well, I know wrestling enough to to be able to say, I don't think Batista's acting that much in this. I just think he... I. Like I never liked him because he was so just boring and weird, and you know he never seemed to get the hang of being on the mic or in front of a camera, and never liked him. So there's a part of me who's like, I don't think he's acting that much in this. I don't think he is the smartest guy in the world. I don't think he's the most. But they compensate by giving him some great fucking lines. Absolutely. Some amazing line. You know what? Okay. Acting? Here we go. Okay? When he says that he is not a princess, <laughs> I, I believe him. I totally believe him. Yeah. I buy into that performance. You know what? I don't think he's a princess. Yeah. You know. Might want to see him in a tiara, you know, just to be sure. But, you know, so that's the thing about that character. No, it is very monotone, and there is no real great performance there. It's like you taught him how to do one thing, he can do it, (laughs) you know? Yeah. Let's give him some interesting dialogue while he does it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. There are some times when he's talking, and I'm like, okay, well, I can tell that you're trying to act. Yeah. But well, you're not doing the best job. But his character is supposed to be sort of uh, socially retarded, so I think that right. they picked the the best socially retarded wrestler yeah. to be this socially retarded person, and I think it, that it, he did a great job. So now I really want to start watching all of the, the James Bond reboots. I never saw any of the Daniel Craig James Bond reboots, but yeah. I, I, I'm, I want to see them because in the next James Bond movie, he's going to be playing a bad guy. And I'm going to be like, okay, so is this going to be the movie where people realize that he's not the best actor in the world? <laughs> because he's yeah. perfect in Guardians of the Galaxy to play this socially awkward, angry man filled with rage. But I can't imagine him being like a heavy. But then again, Richard Keel wasn't the best now, actor in the world. My he was just supposed to look yeah. angry. And he did My that. My absolute favorite character was was Rocket, just like fucking hands down, you know. And when we have that scene after the war in space, scene, <laughs> yeah, uh, with Rocket and, and Drax, and Rocket just fucking stole that show and finally said what I think everybody in the audience wanted to fucking hear, you know, just like you know, fucking boo hoo. Okay. Yeah. Oh, my daughter's dead. My wife's dead. We all have fucking dead people, you know. And it was just such a such a a, a breath, you know. <laughs> yeah. Just like okay, he's the whiny Batman character. I also know? liked in that scene how um, Peter Quill said that he had twelve percent of a plan yeah. because <laughs> that was the same percentage. Of, of the, credit that of the, of the Iron Man movie. gave Pepper in the Avengers movie. Mm-hmm. Give yeah. yourself some credit, like 12%. Yeah. I'm like, ooh, 12%. That's a Marvel thing. <laughs> also, the soundtrack is just amazing. 
Yes, it is. Yes, it is. These are what's what's really funny about them is that most of these songs are songs I never fucking liked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. These are songs. A lot of these songs. With, and it was like that is a Uga Chunk. That is a stupid motherfucking song. You know. And they. I always really liked that song because. I always liked that song a little bit, but only because of uh, Reservoir Dogs. Yeah. And I'm yeah. like, wow, that song was always Reservoir Dogs in my mind, and now to think that, like, another movie has taken that song. And or now I have a hard time of going, oh, yeah, that song was in Reservoir Dogs. Isn't that interesting? Or or the Pina Colada song or so many. Oh, oh God, I, I hate the Pina Colada song. I would never hear Elvin Bishop again. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So God, I hate the Pina songs, Colada they song. Made them, they made them work. They made them work it's, so well. It's funny because my oldest daughter heard the Pina Colada song for the first time like a year ago. And apparently I had heard it enough that it didn't faze me, but she was 12 and she heard the song for the first time and she's like, I guess the same way that people are interested in me watching Firefly for the first time and having all of these bizarre ideas and questions, she heard the song for the first time and she just said, Wait a second, they were going to cheat on each other? <laughs> but they ended up cheating on each other with each other, and now they're just laughing about it? They should have trust issues. They were going to cheat on each other. How can they not know these important things about each other if they're dating? Oh, man, this upsets me. She just... <laughs> so then when she saw Guardians of the Galaxy, she's like, Wait, you saw how could this be in this movie? No! So upset. Like she, was, she was personally upset. Also, the soundtrack is the first soundtrack to ever reach number one on the Billboard charts without having a single original song in it. Yeah. And that's interesting. Most soundtracks have that, you know, at least one damn new ballad in it new or something. But this something was, like that, yeah. Yeah, but this is all just a... Oh, the soundtrack is just amazing. It all just it all worked so perfectly and it's so good. I also like the fact that this movie doesn't seem to have too much of a tie to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Yeah. So a lot of times you see Iron Man Two or you see Captain America or you see Thor the Dark World and you go, Okay, well this is how this is gonna tie in with every with everything else, but Mm-hmm. This film doesn't seem to be worried too much about it. Okay, I like the fact that they fully explained what the Infinity Stones were. I always knew what the Infinity Stones were. Right. And and I realized, like, early on, like, okay, well, so this is where Marvel Comics is going with this. Okay, I understand that, but when are they going to explain it to everyone else in the world? <laughs> because I only know about this because I'm a comic book geek. When are they going to explain to everyone else what this is? Yeah. So I liked that. I liked the fact that Howard the Duck once again became an important I I, I, didn't. I I want my Howard the Duck. Okay? I don't want this Howard the Duck. Yeah, Seth Green Howard voiced Duck. that Howard the Duck. And that's fucking that's... George Lucas's best movie ever. Okay? Now 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 you know, they went and buried it, they sat on it, and this is why nobody hears about George Lucas anymore. You know, they'll be exactly. some mention of like American graffiti and shit like that. You know, because they they decided to just completely squash the fucking genius that is Howard the Duck. You know, and I'm still angry about that. It's an amazing movie. <laughs> mm-hmm. I love Guardians of the Galaxy. I fucking love this movie so much. Uh, you you've seen Heavy Metal, I'm sure, right? Yes. Because Jeannie's not getting it. I try to explain it to her, but that whole scene where they fly into Unknown. Yeah. First off, I love it. I loved that it was a severed fucking head. Yeah. How cool is that? I've written some shit like that. That is so awesome. It's a human fucking yeah. head. Well, not human. And in the head. comic books, that's in the comic books, that's like the base of operations for the Guardians of the Galaxy. Their but their now, kind of headquarters is in nowhere. When they flew in there with the music that they were playing, and it was the David Bowie tune. Moon Age Daydream. 
in particular, when they took the overshot of the Milano, that just reminded me so much of uh, heavy metal. Yeah. You know, it's just did the you ever look seen, and the feel of it. Did you ever see the, the, the sequel they did? Because I never saw the sequel. Oh, it was fucking god-awful. Huh? Oh, well, good, because I never saw that. I, it kind of upset me. Yeah. You don't want to watch it. I didn't watch it on movie. general <laughs> principle. <laughs> it it wasn't... It, it's not awful. It's just not heavy metal. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's... It's, just it's too far metal. removed for it to be in anywhere in any way close to the original heavy metal. Right, exactly. You can't wait that long to make a sequel to something like that. Mm-hmm. If I remember, it was just pretty much one story that was pretty linear. Yeah, that's and not enough, not enough tits, and not enough, frankly, not enough like heavy metal. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so but happy yeah, that, that we... whole scene reminded me of it so much. Yeah. I'm so happy that we finally got around to doing Guardians of the Galaxy, especially since I think that we mention it in almost every episode of this podcast. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I'm so, I'm so do. glad that we finally just got around to just, okay, let's just do Guardians of the Galaxy because that, that fits. Yeah. And it's it's out on DVD and Blu-ray, so we could spoil it now. So yeah, and and again, Rocket, total Rocket fan, and and Jeannie kind of nailed it. What it is about his performance and how Rocket is, he basically hmm. has small man syndrome. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, that's kind of like a kind of like kind of like Joe Pesci and Goodfellas. Exactly. Yeah, he's he's the littlest. He, you know, he's not as strong as everybody else, so he's going to get angrier and more aggressive about everything because of it, because he's compensating for his smaller size. Yeah. You know? It, which is what made Rocket so touching at the end, but all through it, you know, just whenever they would set a mood, Rocket was the perf- perfect character to use to try to break that fucking mood. You know? Yeah. Just be like, all right, I'm standing. We're all standing here like a bunch of jerks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Guardians of the Galaxy was just nominated for a Writers Guild Award for Best Adapted Screenplay. Oh. And I'm excited about no that because that could definitely lead to maybe a like a like like an Oscar nomination or two. Mm-hmm. You know? No, I'm excited I mean, about that. A- just just for for man, there's not much wrong you could say about Guardians of the Galaxy except you're just one of those people like just not into that kind of movie. Which I can totally yeah. dig and wrap around. It's fine, you know. That's no big deal. But like I, I can't see anything wrong with this movie. Yeah. You know, where it should not one win best adapted screenplay or anything like that. The characterization, the characterizations were huge, you know. Yeah. Granted, maybe uh, Gamora is a bit light from uh, what she was in the comic books, but they'll get her there. Yeah. The romantic thing. You, you you ruined moonlighting for me with that romantic tension crap. You ruined who's the fucking boss with that romantic tension crap. Don't do it. Right. Um, oh, and I love seeing John C. Riley in this film, but I think that's just that's because of too. how uh, how obsessed I am, absolutely obsessed I am with the movie Walk Hard, the Dewey Cox story. Really, I got to see that. He's just one of those people that every time I see him, I smile. I can't fucking help it. Yeah. You well, know? he's amazing. He's like, oh, you know, you've never um, seen Walk Hard, the Dewey Cox story? No. It's a it's a it's a really well done parody of biopics. Really? Yeah. That's all it's a parody of of the movie Ray, it's a parody of Walk the Line, it's a parody of so many of those bio movies. 
But uh, the really I funny thing, the really, the really funny yeah. thing about it is that all of the music is fucking wonderful. It's just is he the, absolutely is he the star? wonderful. Yeah, yeah, he plays uh, oh. Dewey Cox, the very, very Johnny Cashian musician. Shit. There's a scene in it with the Beatles oh, you know, where he needs to. Trailer. He meets the Beatles in India, and just like in a bio movie, when he meets them, he's saying things like, that was transcendental what you said, Paul McCartney. Don't you agree, George Harrison of the Beatles? <laughs> and of course, they're saying things like John Lennon says, with meditation, there's no limit to what we can imagine. Oh my God! I just I am beat it. That cover is awesome. Yeah, it's 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 a perfect so movie. It's a parody, and it's really wonderful. But the amazing thing is that all of the music is is just brilliant. It's abs. It's the music stands alone on its own as really really good music. Yeah. And the, one of the best scenes in it, uh, uh, Jack White plays Elvis. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, but I loved him in Magnolia. I even loved him yeah. in a, in um oh what the fuck was it? The Step Brothers. Yes. Was that it with yeah. uh Will Farrell? Will Farrell. I yeah, and uh and uh Talladega Nights. I have not seen Talladega Nights. It, it's pretty good. I stayed away from it because it was like a NASCAR comedy, but once yeah. I embraced it, it's it's a pretty genius movie. And also, because I have kids, I gotta say, he, he was also Wreck-It Ralph in Disney's yeah. Wreck-It Ralph, which is a wonderful movie. Okay. Have you, I, you, I you have absolutely seen... love his face, and, and he just gives this performance that just, his low-key innocence, I think I would have to say yeah. about him. It just I, I don't believe any, anybody is 100% a dick. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. That was yeah. the perfect fucking thing. Hey, it's say. Star Prince! Yeah. 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 No, it's a, because this is an alien yeah. movie, and these are alien characters in far away imaginary lands, but he is being himself in it. And yeah. I like that. Uh -huh. He's just being a, a funny smart ass. He might be playing a Zandarian or whatever, but he definitely is just, he's him in this movie. Mm -hmm. And that's what I like. Exactly. You really should see Wreck-It Ralph. It's a really cute movie. It's essentially um, it, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, but with video games. Yeah. So, uh... Pac-Man's in it, and Street Fighter characters are in it, and it, it, it's really cute. I, I have meant to see it. I'm not sure if it came up on the channels or maybe Jeannie didn't watch it. I, I am I, I am having such a hard time. We've been together for years now. I am having such a hard time pegging down her movie tastes. Yep. <laughs> you know? Um, I'm one of my favorite. Really sure what she and she is out of her mind for the fucking Guardians of the Galaxy, so it's like, oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. One of my favorite movie stories with uh, my wife, is she rented this movie because there was a small window of our relationship where Natasha was obsessed with Twilight. Oh my god. She, really? she read all of the I'm books so and she she saw all of the movies and she was just obsessed with it. So she rented a Robert Pattinson movie. I don't remember what it was called, but it's not important. She said, Oh, it's it's some movie and it's like a like a Romantic drama, and it's set in New York. So I IMDb'd it, and I Wikipedia'd it, and I figured out that this was the movie. The movie. I, it, it's a movie where it's a romantic comedy. It, it's like a, it's a romance, and it's, it's a bit of drama, a bit of comedy, and it's, it's yeah. just a normal movie. But at the end of the movie, he goes to visit his dad, who's on this office building really high in the air, you realize that it's on top. It's it's like a twist second end of the movie, M. Night Shyamalan twist ending that that doesn't yeah. in any way do anything for the script other than, ha-ha, we played a trick on you. Here's a twist ending for no reason. So 
So okay. you realize at the end of the movie, for no reason whatsoever, that this movie was taking place in the year 2001, and his dad's office is on top of the World Trade Center. Oh. And it happens to be the morning of September 11th. Oh, God. For no fucking reason whatsoever. And I'm like, holy shit, this is that, the movie that, that she rented is the Robert Pattinson movie where they kill him in 9-11 for no reason in the last minute of the movie. Oh, how wonderful. I can't wait to see this movie with my wife. So <laughs> she had no idea. And so I'm like, you know what, honey? Do you want to sit down and watch this Robert Pattinson movie? I really want to see it with you. And she eventually knew that something was up because I was watching her watching the movie more than I was watching the movie. Yeah. But at the end of the movie, she's just, she's standing up and she's so pissed. She's like, what the fuck? Did they just fucking kill me? Why did they? And then she turned to me and I, I was just a, you fucking knew, didn't you? You were the opinion of this shit. How, how could you not tell me? And I'm like, that would have ruined the film for you. And she, she was throwing stuff at me. She was so pissed. Oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> my, her movie tastes as well. She's just all over the place. She doesn't like sitting down and watching movies. But when she does, it's always just some sort of really weird, random thing like that. Yeah. It's not that Jeannie's tastes are bad or anything like that, but, like, I will show her something, and it's like, okay, got it. I got it now. Okay. But, you know, like, I'll show her – I tried showing her Sling Blade because I think that's a fucking excellent movie. And yeah. it, she was bored. And so I'm like, okay, she doesn't really like slow burn kind of movies and things like that. And what the fuck did I show her not too long ago? I pretty much put it on because it was like I wanted to see it, and she was sitting here, and I was like, uh, you know, I'm not always in the mood to care if she's not going to like the movie or not. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and it was another real slow burn movie. I forget what the fuck it was, but there was something about it that she really got into this movie. I can't fucking think of what it was. You know, so her, her tastes confuse me when it comes to that because it's like, um, she doesn't like movies that are very. She doesn't like horror movies that are very realistic. Yeah. Okay. So like, The Devil's Rejects. That's not something she's going to dig on, and I can understand that. You know, because it's too. You know, it's not monsters. It's not. You know, it's it's regular people being kind of constant to each other. You know. Yeah. Um. But then I would show her something else, like The Thing. She's all over The Thing. You know? Yeah. So it's not the grossness or anything else. So I was surprised that she liked Guardians of the Galaxy. I was really happy, though. We, when it came out, we were having one of those weekends where it was, like, leading up to it. It was like, we have to got, we got to do something this weekend. We've got to get out of the fucking house for a while. You know? Yeah. I'm sure you have those from time to time, too. You know? Oh, yeah. Uh, so it was like, let's Let's go. Let's make ourselves a double feature. Let's go see Guardians of the Galaxy, and then Dawn of the Planet of the Apes right after it. And she was like, "Okay, cool." And we went through the lineups and all that, and we got it figured out the best we could. And we go to see Guardians of the Galaxy, and we walk out of Guardians of the Galaxy, and we're just like, "Oh fuck!" And we we both smoke, so we save cigarette time and shit, you know. Yeah. And that was fucking awesome. That was fucking amazing. And, like, when we checked the time again, we had missed the opening of uh, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. And I was like, ah, oh, son of a bitch. So we had extra tickets. It's for Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. And it got us back in the theater. And we went back into Guardians of the Galaxy again. Yeah. So That's the first awesome. viewing, we saw it twice. Yeah. Because I didn't want to waste the ticket. Well, that's that's a movie you could do that with. Definitely. And then we we uh, we saw it four times in the theater. 
So we had seen it twice the first day we saw it. Then some other weekend was like, let's let's just go see it again. So we went to see it again. And it's become like kind of a joke in the house, you know? What are we going to do? Let's go see Guardians of the Galaxy. And there was one weekend we were both kind of bored and shit like that. And I posted on Facebook. I was like, we're bored. And fucking Guardians of the Galaxy isn't playing anywhere. <laughs> and and in like under two minutes, my friend Chris, who does another podcast, he does the Are You Serious podcast. You should check it yeah. out. It's a really good podcast. Um, okay. In like two minutes, he had fucking Googled where the goddamn movie was in my town. <laughs> That's awesome. And it was like, oh shit, it hit the cheap theater. <laughs> Let's go, honey. It's a buck. It was, it was, because it was at the point where it was like, this is funny. The only thing that's going to make it funnier is if we actually go see the movie. Yeah. So we did. <laughs> oh, I'm being climbed on. I'm being climbed on by my son. Is he going to end the show again? <laughs> I don't, I don't know. The, hold on a second. Maxwell, what does Groot say? I am Groot. That was good. I am That was a good, that was a good Groot, Maxwell. Yeah. Good job. I need to talk to the raccoon. You need to talk to the raccoon? Yeah. What are you going to say to the raccoon? Raccoon. Oh, okay. Okay. Raccoon. Maxwell really likes uh, <laughs> Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah. Yeah. Which is good. I... I I wanted to catch on as a pet, as a as a catchphrase. If anything from this movie becomes a catchphrase, this is the one that I want all of America to say. So, if you're listening to the show, you really need to start saying this. Pelvic sorcery. Pelvic sorcery. I like that. Ooh, that'd be a good band name. Sorcery. That, that would be a really good band name. That'd be an awesome band name. We are Pelvic Sorcery. That was her best line through the whole movie. Yes. All, yes, it was. all the way. I did like her reaction to uh, Drac as he's expressing his friendship to all of them. Yes. And he's like, and even this green whore. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, my God, did you really say that? Yeah, that's awesome. So you referred to to her as a green whore. <laughs> <laughs> so so, do you have any ideas for next week? Uh, you know, I should have had some ideas. I did not. Uh, I did want. Okay, because I because I have an idea. Because I have an idea. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, I have Netflix, and uh, there's one particular Netflix movie that is available right now on the Netflixes that my family has watched way too many times. Yeah. It's called Godzilla vs. Monster Zero. Okay. And it's an amazing movie. Oh, yeah, and we've never done a God, we, do that. Yeah, we've never done a Godzilla movie. I thought this might be good. A good introduction, yeah. yeah. Destroy All Monsters, that's the one I want to see, and it seems to be like it's on the missing list. Yeah, yeah Destroy All Monsters is a, that's a difficult one to track down. I believe yeah. it's available on, it is available for free on some movie site somewhere. Like, if you, if yeah. you, like, Google video search it. I think it will pop up. It's free on some, on one website. It's not Daily Motion and it's not YouTube, but it is available somewhere. Yeah. I I am particularly fond of Godzilla vs. Monster Zero due to the fact that there's one American in it that's speaking English. <laughs> while everyone else speaks Japanese. I've seen the movie. I have like well, the, that is, the special. That is the famous Nick Adams. Yeah, I've seen the. I have the film on like special edition DVD, so I've seen the Japanese version before. 
And it's really weird to hear someone speak Japanese and then to hear someone go, Exactly, Fujo, buddy. <laughs> because everybody else is just speaking Japanese, but he's still, he's just, I agree. Mutual respect is a important thing. I, I can't imagine doing that. I can't imagine yeah. being is being the only person speaking English in a Mexican movie. You know, I can't imagine that. Yeah, there is a movie that I may want to do at some time in the future, but I have I have not watched it yet. I have only heard about it, and mm. I have found it on I have found it on YouTube. It is a Canadian instructional video. I'm not like an industrial film. Um, okay. You know, like Mr. B Natural or something like that. Except this runs an hour and a half. This is a feature length okay. fucking movie, and it is a police training film called "Defending Against Surviving Edged Weapons." <laughs> nice. I watched nice. a little bit, little of it. It opens with cavemen. It starts really? with cavemen. So yes. So I'm gonna have to watch it. This seems like something that we might have to cover in the future. But yes, I am totally down with Monster Zero. And then sometime in the future, I want to do um, Birdemic or The Room. I'm a big fan of the both of those I movies. Have, I have not seen The Room, so let's do that one. That'll give I, me a good reason. I'll have to find it. I oh, definitely really? have it, but I have gotten it through not-so-nice yeah. means. It's I, one of those I, movies I, where it's, it's, it's available a, a, as a risk track movie, but yeah. like... Like uh, Monster A Go Go or uh, Manos the Hands of Fate, even with wrist tracks, it's a pretty difficult movie to get through. Yeah. It's a yeah. difficult, difficult film. And for the longest time, I didn't see it because so many people were saying, oh, have you seen The Room? This is supposed to be the worst movie of all time. And, and just the popularity of this film as yeah. being the worst film of all time just said, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm staying away from this. Because I think too many that people. one has me keeping away, too. Yeah. Yeah. When I finally did just say, okay, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to watch this movie, that's when I, when I, okay, this really is amazingly horrible. This is this is wonderful, and I can't believe I haven't seen this for so long. It really is amazing. I, we might want to do Birdemic as well at one point. Birdemic I have seen, and, oh, my God, can I ever cut that movie up? I, I I know all the effects that they used. I have them. I've used them myself in little test pieces and things like that. And they look awful, so I have not continued using them in anything. <laughs> yeah. So I could bring a whole different light. Like, that's particle illusion. <laughs> right there. The terrible, smoky, fiery thing. Yeah, I got it someplace. Let me show you. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. But Monster Zero, I'm totally down with that. Yeah, yeah. Sweet. And we haven't done a Godzilla movie, so we should we should definitely get some Godzilla on our plate. Yeah. Awesome. And I have homework. You have homework. What do you got? I have homework. It was difficult for me to 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 narrow it down to a specific episode, but okay. I have an episode of a TV show that I think everybody should watch. It is hilarious. If you've never seen this show before, and I, it, very few people on this earth have seen this television show, so it's, it's something that is near and dear to my heart. It's a television show. It lasted for four seasons. It is one of the funniest shows that has ever existed but because of the channel it was on, it's a TV show that hardly anyone has ever seen. And almost okay. all of the episodes are available on YouTube. It's a show called Cheap Seats. Okay, I, I, I remember you speaking about it on the blog a few times. Yeah. 
it's hosted by a pair of twin stand-up comedians, Randy and Jason Sklar. They have a a comedy special on Netflix, and it's hilarious. They do a version of uh, Five Little Monkeys Jumping on the Bed, which which I've stolen and used at story time before because it's hilarious. But um, essentially, it's Mystery Science Theater but instead of making fun of old movies, they're making fun of some of the bizarre quote unquote sports that they've shown on ESPN. Yeah. ESPN shows sports, but also they've shown uh Steve Garvey fishing specials, they've shown the Redneck Olympics, they've shown lawnmower racing, they've shown college competitive bowling tournaments and they've shown if they they make fun of the spelling bees and they're really great they have some the uh, yeah it's just one of the greatest shows ever and it's hilarious but because it's played on ESPN classic no one has ever seen this show before the only way i ever found out about the show is that one year we went on vacation to disneyland but once we arrived at Disneyland, my wife, who was pregnant at the time, said, I need to take a nap. So she took a four-hour nap. Here we are, like, a, a block away from Disneyland, and she decides to take a nap. But I couldn't leave. I had to stay in the bed with her while she napped for, like, four hours. And I was I was going nuts. So I turned on the TV, and the first thing I see is Randy and Jason making fun of a sport and it was just it's the funniest show ever they make a lot of sports references that i don't get but it's it's so hilarious it's so much like mystery science theater that there's actually an episode of cheap seats where mike and the box appear to make fun of randy and jason making fun of sports (laughs) suddenly you see the the shadows of the seats and and then there, and they go, wait a second, this isn't Monster of Go-Go. And they start making fun of Randy and Jason and Chief Seats, and they say, oh, wow, what a really original idea. People making fun of of uh, of old videos. Wow, that that's a really original idea, Randy and Jason. <laughs> so I had a hard time picking. I wanted to make some Chief Seats the homework because it's just, it's the greatest show ever, but I had a hard time narrowing it down. But I think I finally have the one episode which really shows how wonderful Cheap Seats is. It's okay. season. It's season one, episode nineteen. They make fun of putt putt golf. It's a putt putt golf tournament, and it's one of the greatest episodes of Cheap Seats. It's hilarious. Okay. It's it's. It's a half hour long show. It's available on YouTube. Putt Putt on Golf. YouTube, okay. Yeah. Chief Seats, season one, episode nineteen, Putt Putt Golf. <laughs> Funniest yeah. episode ever. It it it's just a like a twenty two minute video that will brighten your day. Cool. All right. So that is for the homework this week. And yes. the movie will be Monster Zero. Uh, after this episode airs, like the next day after the episode airs, I will upload to our page the animation I have so far for, uh, creation of the humanoids. Sweet. Uh, get the listeners involved, you know, they can, they can possibly see a movie be built from the ground up. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And let me know what you decide about Emerald. If not, I'll pay these sweaty Chinese people, you know, either way, but. Good thinking. That is some that is some boring ass work, which is why I'm not doing yeah. it. <laughs> yes, okay. it is. So okay, um, got to wrap it up because I got to get over to something else. Very sorry about that. Um, watch Bob Bob's Dirty Shorts on YouTube. Go to YouTube um, YouTube.com users forward slash Undead Count Film. Uh, you'll be able to see Bob's 30 Shorts there. You'll be able to see uh, Dying Generation, which, by the way, Steve Norfolk is on the missing list again. So, Steve, if you're listening, get in contact with me. Uh, the new show has started, Utop- uh, Destination Utopia, and the Pokemon yes. film could be found there as well. 
Woo! Go ahead. What do you what do, what do you got? Well, I'd like to I'd like to mention our Stitcher. Yes. We have a Stitcher page for the Pope Stitcher. on film. So if you want to listen to the Pope on film, you can always go to our Stitcher page. So. Yes, you can. I believe they keep those episodes current. Yeah. Uh, but I haven't looked since November. <laughs> yeah. I looked the other day because I – oh, hey, we have a Stitcher page. I should try and figure out what that is because I love it so much. I should find out what it is. But we have a Stitcher. You can go on Stitcher and get stitched. And be sure and check out my blog because I'm going to be watching um, every doctor from Doctor Who, and that's going to be that's going to be uh, crazy. Mm. So be sure and visit my blog, reverendsteve.blogspot.com. And go to the Stitcher. I think this was a good episode. I think this was a very good episode. Um, I'd like you to hang on the line for a moment, if you don't mind. But sure. On, I, I, thank you, everybody, for listening, and we will see you next week. Yes, see you next week, you godless heathens! <laughs>